At one point or another, there were 130 ski areas that dotted Western Canada. Some of these places weren't much to look at, a platter lift, a small warming hut, and a few runs. Other places were larger, with proper base lodges, chairlifts, and many ski runs. Currently, there are around 75 operating ski hills in Western Canada, leaving 50 forgotten in time. This video will take you through most abandoned ski resorts in Western Canada, starting with the province of Manitoba and ending in British Columbia. There were a handful of abandoned ski resorts where there is little to no information on their existence. These places are not included in this video, simply due to there being virtually no information about them at all. Please enjoy this video. Number 1. Mount Agassiz, Manitoba one of the more prominent abandoned ski hills on this list, Mount Agassiz was a decent sized mountain that operated two separate peaks with three lifts, two T-bars and a double chair. As the ski resort operated within Riding Mountain National Park, it required special lease from the Parks Canada to operate. While originally the resort featured one peak and two T-bar lifts, an expansion on the ski hill in the 1980s saw a new Skyway double chair up and new peak added. This boosted the ski resort to one of the best between the Rockies and Ontario. Snows here. The adventure of downhill skiing is yours right now at beautiful Mount Agassiz. Featuring the highest vertical runs in the province, beginner and intermediate runs, and all of the resort features you'll need. Rental shop, T-bars, chairlifts, ski patrol, special student programs and group rates. The warmth and relaxation of Agassiz's own cafeteria and lounge. Mount Agassiz, the place to be this winter, just 160 miles northwest of Winnipeg in Riding Mountain National Park. Unfortunately, many bankruptcies and declining ski refits have spelled the end for Mount Agassiz. It shuttered its operations circa 2000 and has not operated since then. In 2013, Parks Canada was seriously considering the possibility of reopening the resort. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, and the lifts and base lodge were demolished. The area is now incorporated back into Riding Mountain National Park. There are no plans to reopen Mount Agassiz. Number 2. Mount Glenorchy, Manitoba while there's not much information on this lost ski area, there are a few known facts about its existence. It opened in the late 1960s with a rope tow powered by an old tractor. There were around three or four ski runs that provided a nice beginner learning area. For unknown reasons, it was closed sometime in the early 2000s. The runs are still visible from an aerial view. Number 3. Mount Blackstrap, Saskatchewan Blackstrap was built by the provincial government in 1971 for the Canada Winter Games. A unique thing about Blackstrap is that it was built in an old landfill to help create vertical. Blackstrap originally opened with just a Mueller T-bar, but in the 80s was expanded with a Doppelmayer triple chair. The ski area operated for many years until the provincial government shut it down for the 2007 ski season. One year later, the lodge burnt to the ground, effectively dashing any hopes that the ski resort would be open. The rest of the infrastructure sat on the hill for many years, slowly succumbing to vandalism until 2019, when all remains of the lift and other buildings were removed. However, all hope isn't lost for Blackstrap, as the provincial government is looking into options for eventually reopening the mountain. Whether that will be in the form of downhill skiing remains to be seen. Number 4. Okapawas, Saskatchewan Opened in 1971 as Saskatchewan's biggest ski resort, Lasto cooperated until 1981 when the First Nation Band took over operations and renamed it Okapowis. In addition to this, they also modernized the ski resort by adding a new BM Lifts quad chair sometime in the mid-90s. Okapowis operated until 2011 when the band came to the conclusion that it wasn't feasible to operate the ski hill year after year without a profit margin. Thus, Okapowis ceased operations. However, the band is currently developing a long-range master plan that, if implemented, will see Okapowis become a four-season resort, with mountain biking, hiking, downhill, and cross-country skiing, as well as other activities. The timeline for this is currently unknown. Number 5. Prairie West Terminal Snow Park, Saskatchewan while there isn't much known about Prairie West Terminal, I have been able to dig up a few facts about its existence. It was operated by a local company called Prairie West Terminal until its closure in 2009. Apparently, labor shortages made the operation very hard to staff, which is why Prairie West Terminal eventually just decided to pull the plug on the entire operation. I don't believe it has operated since, however, it appears all the infrastructure is still on the mountain. Number 6. White Tracks, Saskatchewan Another small lost ski area, White Tracks operated successfully for a few decades until limited funds and poor snow forced the closure of the ski hill. Almost all the infrastructure that remains at White Tracks and the ski area is a popular hiking spot nowadays. There are no known plans to bring back White Tracks. Number 7. Shaganapi, Alberta 
The Calgary Ski Club was formed in 1935 with the goal of promoting skiing to Alberta. In 1949, the city of Calgary gave them permission to use the north slopes of the Shaganapi Golf Course as a ski slope. Brush was cleared and a tow rope was installed. A few years later, the club replaced the tow with a Mueller T-bar. Unfortunately, no snowmaking paired with a low base elevation meant that the hill was completely reliant on natural snow. Additionally, the city had concerns over what the ski hill was doing to the golf course. This led to the eventual closure of Shaganapi Ski Club in 1960. Number 8. Fortress, Alberta Fortress is currently the biggest lost ski resort in Canada. Opening in 1967 under the name Snow Ridge with two T-bars and a double chair, Snow Ridge quickly grew in popularity due to its close proximity to Calgary. In 1975, the ski hill expanded with two new chairlifts opening up the ridge to lift surface skiing. Sometime in the 1970s, it was purchased by the Aspen Skiing Company, which was also when the name changed from Snow Ridge to Fortress. Eventually, it was sold to RCR. The problem started coming for Fortress in the 1980s with the development of Nikiska Skiria. Not only did Nikiska have a modern lift fleet and a substantially higher vertical drop than Fortress did, it was also a lot closer to Calgary than Fortress was. RCR ended up buying Nikiska a few years after the 1988 Olympics, and for around 10 years they operated both Fortress and Nikiska. The only thing RCR did during the time when they operated both hills was to put in some new condos at the base of Fortress. Eventually, facing aging infrastructure and declining ski air visits, RCR decided to pull the plug and Fortress closed in 2004. There were many attempts to reopen Fortress, and one party successfully reopened it for a few weeks in 2006-07. However, the provincial government was quick to shutter Fortress after the company failed to replace an unsafe bridge. Fortress had abandoned until 2011 when a cat skiing operation took over and semi-reopened the mountain. Fortress has also been used to film many Hollywood movies such as Inception and The Bourne Legacy. There is not a time frame when the ski hill is expected to reopen, but each year more improvements are made to the hill. In addition, Fortress has a massive build-out expansion plan that would, dec that would transform the once decrepit Fortress ski hill into a massive destination resort. Number 9. Happy Valley, Alberta in 1959, a local investor bought up much of the area that is now Valley Ridge and intending to turn it into an amusement park created just that. Happy Valley included a campground, trail rides, a 50 meter indoor swimming pool, go-karts, trampolines, and a three-par golf course. In 1962, Happy Valley became a winter sports destination with the installment of a Poma platter lift. This platter lift serviced four ski runs and could lift 800 people per hour. In 1967, it was sold to an American investment group. This group invested very little into the complex and it fell into disrepair. They tried selling it to the city but the city rejected it, citing it was too far away from city limits. In 1974, it was sold to a different U.S. group before Calgarian Bob Allen bought it in 1976. He ran the complex for a few years before adding an 18-hole golf course. He later sold it to a Los Angeles group that planned to create a Hollywood North complex, but that plan never came to fruition. The pool, campground, and ski hill were demolished and replaced with the Valley Ridge neighborhood, while the golf course remains to this day in operation. Number 10. Eden Lake, Alberta Eden Lake Resort opened in 1966 by brothers Irwin and Will Zeiter, both who own a construction company. They wanted to develop a year-end resort on the shore of Lake Eden, close to Edmonton. In 1972, they piled up 28,000 cubic meters of dirt and planted 12,000 trees, increasing the 25-meter hill to 60 meters. They installed a Doppelmeyer double chairlift along with two Doppelmeyer T-bars and two rope toes. Although the Zeiter brothers lost the resort due to receivership in 1983, the ski hill continued to operate until the early 1990s when it closed for good. Number 11, Mista Haya, Alberta. Built on the banks of the Battle River, Mista Haya operated as a local skiria for the town of Wainwright for many years. The skiria had eight marked trails ranging from green to black. Two T-bars serviced the main hill and a rope to service the Bunny Hill operations. Unfortunately, in 1990, rising insurance costs forced Mista Haya to cease operations. Nowadays, Mista Haya operates as a resort and concert venue. Many of the old ski trails are still maintained and used for hiking. There are no plans to reopen the ski hill, although the T-bars remain as a relic of the past. Number 11B, Aspen Heights, Alberta. I only discovered this lost ski area as I was editing this video. The history of this place is very vague, but I can gather that Aspen Heights opened in 1996 with a used Mueller double chairlift. From aerial view, there looks to be around six runs off the chairlift. The ski hill never had a website, and the only reference I found of it was with the YouTube channel Shred the Gnar. Aspen Heights closed around 2005-2006. All the infrastructure remains on the mountain. There are no known plans to reopen Aspen Heights. Number 12. Pigeon Mountain, Alberta. 
In 1966, a new ski hill off the Trans-Canada Highway near the hamlet of Dead Man's Flats was constructed. Pigeon Mountain originally had two springy poma lifts and a handful of runs, most of which were easy. They often ran free ski lessons for around 500 children in Calgary every weekend. Unfortunately, the ski hill's placement made skiing operations a challenge. Due to south-facing exposure and low elevation, Pigeon Mountain only operated from mid-January to mid-March. Faulty snowmaking equipment contributed to the hill's decline and in 1968 closed. The ski hill reopened in 1979 with a Mueller chair, but that only lasted until 1983. The double chair went to Canyon Ski Resort, where it still operates. After the closure, an Albertan businessman built the current Banff Gate Mountain Resort on the bottom slopes of the former Pigeon Mountain Ski Hill, which features 44 chalets and a swimming pool. There are no plans to bring back Pigeon Mountain. Number 13. Drumheller Valley, Alberta. One of Alberta's newest ski hills, Drumheller Valley was always a community-centered ski hill. Opening in 1992, Drumheller Valley featured a riblet quad chair and around six runs. Drumheller Valley operated for two decades until a dispute with the town of Drumheller. In 2009, the town agreed to expand the ski hill's operating lease on the condition that Drumheller Valley Ski Hill acknowledge and settle its debts within a reasonable time frame. One year later, none of the conditions were met, and the Drumheller Valley Ski Hill lost its non-profit organization status. A few years later, the land was sold to the nearby Passion Play, who intended to see use at Flodge and the parking facilities. They sold the trail to Big Bam, where it was never installed, and then to the new ski resort of Zinkton in British Columbia. Number 14, Turner Valley, Alberta. Turner Valley was formed in the 1940s with the installation of a rope tow, the parts of which were donated by an oil company. The original clubhouse was an old city of Calgary streetcar at the bottom of the hill. In 1959, the club moved locations and installed a Poma lift, traveling at a distance of 1,300 feet with a 258-foot vertical drop. Four ski runs, ranging from green to blue, were right off the Poma lift. The Lieutenant Governor of Alberta even attended the opening ceremony, taking a sleigh from the town of Turner Valley to the ski hill. The Poma lift cost $20,000 and had 50 platters. It had a capacity of 900 skiers an hour. Residents began to refer to Turner Valley Ski Hill as Little Banff. Unfortunately, within a few seasons, vandalism had started to appear on the ski hill, and that eventually led to the closure of the hill when the Poma lift was broken beyond repair. Today, there are no remnants of the ski hill, and a former location is private property. Number 15. Wintergreen, Alberta. Calgary resident Robert Lyon had a dream. That dream was to build and manage a ski resort outside of Calgary. And in 1972, he did just that. Lion Mountain boasted a 475-foot vertical drop, and it had four lifts, a tandem double chair, and two separate T-bars. In 1985, Wintergreen expanded further with a new quad chair, servicing more advanced terrain. Eventually, Wintergreen ended up in the hands of RCR, who ran it until 2003, when they decided to pull the plug in all operations. With two other mountain resorts closely competing with Wintergreen, it probably didn't make sense to continue operating it, as the list sorely needed an update, and the snow quality was often pretty bad. These factors all led to the decision to permanently close Wintergreen. In 2015, RCR proposed creating a mountain condo development on the former ski hill site. However, that was rejected by the county. Although the ski area currently sits abandoned, the golf course is still in operation. One out of all the chairlifts is still standing on the mountain. Number 16. Morning Mountain, British Columbia. Morning Mountain was a small local ski hill located right outside the town of Nelson, BC. The resort operated for a few decades before fire destroyed the lodge. Facing low skiing numbers and an uncertain future, the decision was made not to rebuild. The lift was removed and the former ski hill designated a provincial park. There are no plans to bring back Morning Mountain. Number 17. Crystal Mountain, British Columbia. Last Mountain Ski Resort opened in 1967, its function as a small day use ski area near the city of West Kelowna. It originally opened with a Mueller double chairlift and a Doppelmayr T-bar. Sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, a Poma triple chair was bought used from Europe and installed at Last Mountain. This nearly doubled the size of the resort and gave Last Mountain many more trails. In 1992, the resort rebranded as Crystal Mountain. In March of 2014, a serious roping of the old Mueller double resulted in the hospitalization of four people, two of them ending up in critical condition. This spurred on many lawsuits against Crystal, resulting in the closure and abandonment of the ski hill. However, all hope isn't lost for Crystal, as the new owner is working very hard to reopen the mountain under a new name, Bull Mountain Adventure Park. His plan is to start small with just the T-bar and then open the triple chair. The time frame of this is still unknown, but I wish all the best to his efforts on reopening. Number 18, Forbidden Plateau, British Columbia. 
Opened in 1966 under the name Wood Mountain Ski Park, Forbidden Plateau quickly became the best ski resort in Vancouver Island. The ski hill's popularity peaked in the 70s, which resulted in an expansion with a new Mueller's Tea Bar up an adjacent mountain. The name was changed to Forbidden Plateau sometime in the 1980s. Unfortunately for Forbidden Plateau, a lodge fire, deferred maintenance, and aging infrastructure spelled looming doom for the ski resort. When a heavy snowfall collapsed the roof of the lodge in 1999, that was it. Forbidden Plateau was no more. In 2017, the remains of the lodge and lifts were all removed. Number 19. Green Mountain, British Columbia. While the history of Green Mountain is fuzzy, what we do know is that the ski hill opened in the late 1960s and operated until the early 80s when the lodge burnt down. Green Mountain had two Doppelmeyer tea bars and a rope tow servicing beginner terrain. As the hill was built high in the mountain, snow quality wasn't an issue. It appears that the thing that shuttered the operation was the fire in the lodge. Number 20, Kelowna Mountain, British Columbia. Kelowna Mountain has a very messy history behind it. The land was bought by an investor named Mark Consoligno for $7 million in 2005. Apparently, he didn't bother to rezone any of the land and went ahead with building the lift, the wine cave, the suspension bridges, welcome center, waterfall, boardwalk, and vineyards. Unfortunately, much of the money Mark Consoligno used was funded by investors who had purchased $40,000 or of $150,000 shares. In 2012, the BC Securities Commission halted further investments on Kelowna Mountain for 15 months. Coincidentally, this was when the chairlift was being built. However, during this time, Constantine was also sued by the City of Kelowna for ignoring zoning laws. Eventually, the BC Securities Commission lifted the ban in 2013, and Constantine reopened much of the mountain and was allowed to pay back some debt. Then in 2018, a court ordered that part of the property be sold to pay back unpaid loans. Somehow, despite all these challenges, Constantine found a way to find a new lender who agreed to pay back the loans and the mountain has remained under his control. Since then, nothing has been happening on the property. Much of it has fallen into a state of disrepair, excluding the Welcome Center. One last thing that Conflict Newton considers the ridiculously low elevation of Kelowna Mountain. At this point, I doubt the ski hill will ever be completed. I wonder what the future of this property holds. Number 21, Kitsa Malcolm, British Columbia. Kitsa Malcolm is a very unique case of a ski resort literally being moved from one mountain to another. The ski resort opened sometime in the 1970s in a good snow year. Several government dignitaries were transported up the future ski hill in a tile call grooming machine. They liked what they saw, and a few years later, Kits and Malcolm opened to the public. The ski hill operated until the late 1980s when poor snow years crippled the operation. Instead of permanently closing the mountain, a decision was made simply to move it up to a higher elevation site. Thus, everything at Kits and Malcolm from the lodge to the lifts was moved up to what is now called Shames Mountain. Shames Mountain continues to operate. Number 22. Lac Lejeune, British Columbia. Lac Lejeune opened in 1947. It offered downhill as well as cross-country skiing. It operated as a family-oriented ski hill until 1992 when it was deemed too unprofitable to operate. People were going to the much larger Sun Peaks Resort nearby, not Lac Lejeune. Thus, the ski hill has been frozen in time, many of the buildings showing extreme signs of deterioration, although all of the infrastructure, including the lifts, are still there. Number 23, Mount Aerosmith, British Columbia. Mount Aerosmith opened in the late 60s or early 70s with two T-bars servicing a handful of runs. A few years later, the ski hill expanded with a new Doppelmayr double chair on a completely different section of the mountain. Mount Aerosmith branded itself as only one ski area with two. Unfortunately, in the late 1990s, the resort shrunk to just two T-bars as the double chair was abandoned. They left the two T-bars in operation until the early 2000s when they too were abandoned. Apparently, the remote location of Mount Aerosmith, combined with a treacherous access road, spelled the end for this ski operation. The final struck came for the remaining half of Mount Aerosmith when the lodge burnt to the ground. Today, apart from the old lift towers, there isn't much remaining of Mount Aerosmith. Most of the runs are completely grown in, and not much tells the story of this once busy ski hill. Number 24, Mount Hayes. British Columbia. One of the most unique abandoned ski resorts in Western Canada is Mount Hayes. Although you wouldn't know it now, Mount Hayes was once the site of a busy winter ski hill featuring a Mueller four-passenger detachable gondola and a T-bar servicing most of the ski runs. While the T-bar serviced green to blue runs, the gondola lift traversed over double black terrain. The main attraction of Mount Hayes was undoubtedly the gondola lift. At the summit terminal of the gondola was a ski chalet which had a mountain restaurant. Unfortunately, Mount Hayes was never in a solid financial position. Repeatedly for some years, the town had helped the ski hill stay afloat. This ended in 1999, when then-Mayor Peter Lester pulled the plug on Mount Hayes. Ironically, this came after an extensive renovation of the Mountain Chalet restaurant and many upgrades to the gondola. The T-bar was removed and much of the gondola was sold to Purden Ski Village, though it has not been put up. Sometime in the mid-90s, the Mountain Chalet burnt down. All that's left of the Mountain Hayes Ski Resort are around 12 gondola towers in the mountain, relics of a rich but forgotten past. All the ski runs have grown in. 
Number 25, Silvertip, British Columbia. Located in the beautiful Sunshine Valley near Vancouver, British Columbia, Silvertip was the dream of two brothers, Donald and Ray Lowe. They envisioned a year-round recreational community built in the valley that would include summer and winter activities. As part of their development, they purchased and installed a Doppelmayr T-Bar up Silvertip Mountain. For unknown reasons, the ski area has been closed in the past few decades, although there is some interest in eventually reopening the ski area with a bigger footprint. Number 26, Snowpatch, British Columbia. Snowpatch was the dream of local resident of Princeton, Jim Jackson. Jackson had been involved in the community of Princeton for many years prior and was an avid lover of skiing. He supported new ski resort developments such as Apex and Manning Park. In the 80s, Jackson enlisted friends and members of the community to help build a new community ski hill. Snowpatch featured a Harush T-Bar and around three to four ski runs. It is unknown when or why the ski hill closed for good. However, the area is currently run by the town as a cross-country skiing venue. The T-Bar still partially stands as a reminder to the town of the history. Number 27, Sparwood, British Columbia. Sparwood Ski Hill was most likely built in the 1960s or 1970s. Sparwood didn't offer much vertical or challenging terrain, but it did offer an affordable ski hill for the town of Sparwood. In the mid-80s, cross-country ski trails were added through the ski hill. In 1995, Sparwood Ski Hill closed permanently due to rising insurance costs. The base lodge was still standing until 2013 when the town demolished the old building. There are no plans to bring back the old ski hill. Number 28. Tabor Mountain, British Columbia. Opening in 1967 with a Doppelmayr T-Bar, Tabor Mountain provided the residents of Prince George with a winter recreational venue. The ski hill slowly expanded in the 80s with a Skyway triple chair that further expanded the ski hill and made it more accessible. Tabor Mountain operated both winter and eventually added a downhill mountain bike course for the summer. Sadly, the old lodge was destroyed in an overnight fire in 2018. This effectively shut down the operation. However, Tabor Mountain is still planning a reopening sometime in the future with a new lodge. The time frame is still unknown. Number 29. The Hills, British Columbia. The Hills was a small ski hill operated by the larger Hills Health Ranch Resort, close to a 100-mile house in northern British Columbia. I don't know when the ski hill opened or the exact year of closure. The last semi-operating video I have seen of it was taken in 2014 by the YouTube channel Shred the Nar. Since then, the Hills has not offered downhill skiing and the rope tool remains abandoned. Number 30, Tillicum Valley, British Columbia. Overshadowed by the much larger Silver Star Mountain Resort, Tillicum Valley was a small family-owned operation. It opened sometime in the 60s with the Mueller T-Bar, but in 1978 expanded with a double chairlift. Tillicum Valley also put in a summer alpine coaster. Unfortunately, Tillicum Valley closed sometime in the 80s, and not much remains of the mountain. It is unclear if the chairlift was sold to a different area or simply scrapped. Number 31, A2 Ski Village, British Columbia. A2 Ski Village was first developed in 1965 by a group of investors looking to create a new ski hill. They installed a T-Bar up the mountain, servicing four slopes. In 1979, the investors sold their shares and the new Powder King was developed a bit further north. Although the master plans for Powder King from the 1980s show an incorporation of the old A2 Ski Village into the modern resort, that has yet to happen. The old A2 Ski Lodge and T-Bar still remain on the mountain. It is unclear whether Powder King will one day incorporate A2 into their footprints. Number 32, Lytton Ski Club, British Columbia. The Lytton Ski Club was a small ski operation established in 1968. The club originally installed a rope tow near Botany Lake, but in 1972 moved the operation closer to Lytton. Throughout the years, the ski club struggled and finally in 1987 disbanded. The region was due to low interest in skiing and high insurance. Although there are many abandoned ski resorts in Western Canada, it is important to remember all the ski resorts that have operated successfully for many decades in their current form. Next time you pass a small local ski hill, don't just drive by. These places need your support to stay in operation. It is a ski hill that gives the town its unique culture, even if it's a small ski hill. I don't want to see this list expand in the future. I want to see sustainable ski hills operating successfully, providing generations of families with good outdoor fun. Let's all aim for that. Thank you for watching this video. Please consider subscribing. And until next time, this is Skier72.